Welcome aboard, shipmates. This is Real Sailors, Real Sea Stories, a training program created for the United States Naval Sea Cadet Corps by our friends and supporters at the Navy Talent Acquisition Group in Philadelphia. I'm your support. I'm, who am I? I'm your host, Warrant Officer David Cheese from the Naval Sea Cadet Corps, and I am joined by our all-star crew of MC1 Quinlan, who's our PAO, STG1 Lewison, who's our Technical Support Director, and also from the Naval Sea Cadet Corps, we have Ensign DePippo, who's our talent coordinator. So what are we talking about today? Cadets, this is probably one of your number one favorite subjects of all time. Hey, let's figure out explosive ordnance disposal. You want some pressure? This is some pressure. And we're about to get a good presentation about a guy who knows this extremely well. So our guest today is Lieutenant Vincent DeMacus from EOD Group 2. And he's going to give us all the information you ever wanted to know about EOD, which is pretty intense. So make sure as we go through our presentation today, and I know you're going to have questions, put them in the comments section, write them up, I'll get them to the lieutenant, and you'll find out more about EOD. So cadets, as we go along today, you know, ask your questions, you'll get them answered. But remember, at the end, there will be the opportunity for you to take an online quiz. The quiz will be the items which we discuss about today. And if you complete that and have the satisfaction of doing so, you'll get two hours of virtual drill credit. So enough of that. So, Lieutenant, I want to turn this over to you. Sir, this ship is all yours. All right. Well, thank you, Warren. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, hopefully uh, garner some good conversation, maybe some interest in the EOD community. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning. I heard we're kind of worldwide here, so that's pretty good. So I'm uh, Lieutenant Vince Demacus. I am the readiness officer at EOD Mobile Unit 2, which is under EOD Group 2. Uh, I'm from Spokane, Washington. I've been in the Navy uh, since April of 2000. So I've been in for just over 20 years. Um, why I joined? Well, my father served, he was in the Navy. Uh, that was a big impact on me when I was growing up. Uh, he was, uh, I was, Found it fascinating to look at his uh, his officer's sword and uh, and then put on his flight jacket when I was a kid and um, I was fascinated by aviation and aircraft and I always wanted to be a pilot especially after Top Gun came out um, and uh, I decided ultimately to go a different route uh, I wanted to uh, my interest changed as I grew a little bit older and got into high school um, and one thing that was kind of never lost on me growing up and it had a lot to do with my upbringing but was that you know we have certain freedoms and uh, the ability to do what we want and to choose as we want as americans and i felt an obligation uh, as it says up there to get back to this country so i felt uh, it was a bit of a duty at some point military was going to be in my uh, life forever how long i didn't know but um but since my father served in the Navy and I was interested uh, in the expeditionary side of the house uh, between special operations and uh, special warfare, I decided that uh, the Navy was going to be my route. and I was going to go into EOD. So, um, so your, your father's experience, you said he was he was in aviation. What, what did he do? So he wasn't in aviation. I was fascinated by aviation. Ah, okay. The thing that I loved all sorts of aircraft or whatever it was. My father, um, he had flights jacket if that's what you're leaning towards um sure. because he was a flight surgeon he's a, a physician oh, okay. uh so that's where his route was um but the thing that's uh kind of brought me into eod um i thought it was pretty unique and interesting you know when you think about it there's not a lot of information on it outside of um there's a few books here or there uh, i think right now with you know the internet there's a lot of things that you can look up uh, i didn't have that ability you know back in the uh, early 90s when i was going through high school so i did a few readings uh on certain subjects that kind of piqued my interest i uh, went to boot camp um and uh you know kind of sealed the deal at the uh, dive motivator speech that we went through there but I'll, I'll get into that stuff in a little bit but so the thing that i love about my job um is the community the 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 fraternity of being in Navy EOD, it's this, you know, the shared sense of just constantly leaning forward to get the job done. Uh, it's a no fail uh, mission. A lot of times it's uh, a no quit mission every time. And uh, there's a lot of responsibility that's put on our shoulders uh, at a very junior rank. Uh, and so we vet the community coming in, the people coming into our community uh, pretty highly. 
And we've had a lot of good success in that. So we have a, a high caliber of individual men and women that serve in our ranks. And uh, it's really an honor and I'm absolutely blessed to be a part of this community, uh, especially over, you know, the last 19, 20 years that I've been in have been pretty dynamic for our community. And, you know, what it what it was when I entered into EOD to what it, you know, has um, flexed into through, you know, 19 years of, of ground war um, is is pretty impressive and it's a great thing to be a part of. So um, my top Navy memory, uh, September 11th, I don't, it's not like a fun memory at all, but it's certainly, uh, it set the tone for my community uh, and it set the tone for my career. Um, it was a very, uh, very significant event for me. Um, so when I was going through EOD school, I was actually sitting in uh, day one of our IED division, Improvised Explosive Device Division, uh, as a student. And we'd just gone over uh, the domestic uh, terror attacks, and we just covered the 1993 bombing on the World Trade Center. And we went on a break, and there was an instructor at the back of class that said, you know, there's an airplane that just struck one of those towers. And we didn't have any idea that it was a, an airliner, but it was figured probably a Cessna or something smaller. We went on break, came back. I uh, had a brief on international attacks on uh, U.S. assets uh, um, from terror, and uh, they basically came in halfway through that brief and stopped us and, and told us what was going on. Um, and, you know, not really knowing it at the time, but sitting in IEDs, uh, IEDs were not, you know, that wasn't a household term at the time. Um, it was something that came about uh, through years of conflict overseas. And so, uh, it was a pretty significant event for me, so that's why I put that on there. It's probably my top Navy memory. I certainly have a lot, good, bad, um, that go with it. But So my previous assignments, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. Um, when I was in Spokane, uh, I graduated high school. I went down to Washington State University. Uh, I graduated from there in 1999, and I, um, I was an athlete down there, so I had to tool around and, and change my uh, physical uh, training regimen to get more of like an endurance because I knew I was going to go for one of these programs. So by the time I felt I was ready for all that, I uh, um, I went to a, an officer recruiter and basically found out that I, I'd missed the selection board uh, for that year to go into EOD. And so I had another year until I was going to be looking at um, uh, getting a chance to be selected for EOD. Uh, so I decided I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to wait around that long. I was ready to go. So I enlisted. The Navy, I went to boot camp. I depth in uh, December of 99. I went to boot camp in April of 2000. Uh, I was there for a little bit. Uh, back in the day, we didn't have EOD was not a rate. Uh, so we had to choose a source rating. So I chose aviation ordinance. Uh, two reasons. One, if I was going to try to go EOD, I figured probably good if I could know how to put some of these bombs together. It might help me in taking them apart, which eh, kind of helped. Didn't help as much as I was kind of hoping it for <laughs> in EOD school. But um the other reason was a shorter A school is only a few weeks long. I didn't have to wait long to get into the pipeline. So I went to boot camp, qualified, went to uh, for EOD, went through aviation ordinance uh, school down in Pensacola, Florida, graduated from there. And I went over to uh, dive school in Panama City. So about an hour and a half uh, east of Pensacola. I was there at dive school, uh, went through the special operations diving division for EOD divers and uh, finished there. Uh, in March of 2001, and I transferred to Naval School Explosive Warrants Disposal in Niceville, Florida, um, and off of, uh, it's a part of uh, Eglin Air Force Base. So I went over there, which is actually about 45 minutes back towards Pensacola. So I, I was very fortunate in that uh, my initial training in the Navy all took place in Florida. It was a good time to be there. Uh, it's a great location all around. Um, but I went through training there. Uh, I graduated uh, in March of the following year in 2002 and I went to uh, follow on with tactical training. I'll get into the training side of the house a little bit later in the slideshow, but I went there, um, followed on to my permanent duty station. I went to Mobile Unit 6 in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and the really unique part of that was the time frame that I hit um, getting to that command. Uh, very shortly after I was there, uh, we were overseas getting ready for the kickoff uh, of uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. So um, I have some guys that showed up to our command, actually, uh, that were in dive school instructors of ours, and they kind of rolled into some of the platoons and the LPO slots and the LCPO slots. And, uh, you know, they were kind of 
they were ribbing us for it, but you know, we were fortunate that these guys waited years to be in the right position to go and apply their trade as EOD. And, and here we were a bunch of junior guys showing up and right out the gates, getting to do everything that you train for. And, and one thing when I've talked to people about that, as you kind of equate it to, like I can imagine being a professional athlete and always going to practice, hitting the weights, training, doing whatever, but never really getting to play a game. And so for uh, for a while there, you had to be in the right place at the right time there um, in, in EOD to get you know in on either Bosnia or get in on the an initial Gulf War back in 1991. So uh, we were really fortunate to be in a position to head out uh, overseas and start doing the trade. So I was on a, a mine countermeasures platoon. Uh, we called them detachments back then, but I was on um, that uh, rest board uh, or responsible organizations, what we call our platoons now. Um, I was in that unit and went overseas uh, and helped with the kickoff of the war. We uh, did mine countermeasures uh, in the Northern Arabian Gulf uh, leading up into Iraq and uh, had some time on the ground in Iraq doing some really cool stuff. Um, came back from that deployment, um, I was gearing up for another one. I got injured, unfortunately, so I got pulled off of that, but I was able to uh, get back in line uh, and I was able to get on the ground in Iraq. So I went to Iraq for six months, I got extended there another six months, but the Navy reached in and said they had other things for us to do. So they pulled us at nine total. So I did a uh, EOD response operations in East Baghdad um, for nine months there. Um, and then I came back. I had another deployment that was really cool. Went overseas uh, for a little bit to Norway and we were going after uh, World War II ordnance. A lot of local divers dive out there and, and find pieces and remnants of war from uh, World War II, et cetera. And so they have so much of it. They do a lot of exercises overseas and they have opportunities for us to go out and take care of some of that ordinance. So it was a really cool opportunity. Work with a lot of really great individuals at the other, um, uh, at, from the other NATO uh, countries and our allies, um, which is a unique perspective. You know, one thing that's great about Navy EOD is that we're kind of the jack of all trades. We do the land, the surface side of the house, we do the underwater side of the house. Um, that sets us apart, obviously, from our other uh, DOD branches is the underwater piece. But when you look at some of the other uh, NATO or allied countries, um, they have units that are designated for strictly, you know, UXOs. They have, the, and then they have a unit that's designated for IEDs, and then they have units that are designated for uh, underwater. We bring all of that stuff together uh, in the Navy, so it's it's pretty unique. But you learn it and and meet all that those people. And uh, I learned uh, a lot about how they function. And, and it really helped later on, because when you're over in Afghanistan or you're over in Iraq, a lot of times we were working with coalition forces. And so I had a better understanding of who they were. But anyway, so I went to Iraq, came back. Um, from there, I transferred down for some decompression time. I was uh, a, an instructor at EOD school back down in uh, Florida. Um, and I picked up Chief Petty Officer while I was there. Um, we, my wife and I, I'm married, I have four kids. Uh, so my wife and I decided that for our oldest, we're going to try to leave him in his school for a little bit longer. So I decided to take, uh, an individual augment T assignment out of EOD school. Uh, so I went to joint ID defeat organization, uh, out of, uh, Washington DC, Crystal city area. Uh, I was the EOD NCO for their Afghanistan field team. Uh, so basically I checked into the band and three days later I was on a plane over overseas to Afghanistan. I had a uh, great deployment over there. I was uh, there for a total of about 13 months. Were you, ex um, were you expecting, were you thinking, were you thinking that you were part of the, uh, uh, yeah. oh, we're really echoing here. Uh, or were you expecting to stay in DC? Was that like a big surprise? Oh, no, no. That's, I, I understood that. They, they didn't even tell you, like, do not PCS up here. Don't bring any gear. Okay. with you we don't have a desk for you which was kind of part of the reason i ended up staying there 13 months i was only supposed to be there for 12. they actually wanted me to stay a little bit longer but um so while i was over there uh i had applied for and uh, was selected as a limited duty officer so I, I selected for my commissioning uh source and so when you select for ldo you're not allowed to or, or select for a commission you can't transfer from the command you're at um until you actually you know put on the rank and then you go so they they wanted to leave me in afghanistan for another four months i was able to work a deal and i went uh permissive tdy or temp, uh, i was allowed to go down to eod school and kind of help out teaching there with my family before i commissioned but yeah so they tell you not to move there at all yeah so i went to jido um but i was in afghanistan for 13 months like i said i did about three months in the capital and i was doing uh, i was running with some u.s special forces elements some uh, NATO special forces elements and I was uh, helping them out on missions 
And then uh, they had a requirement for uh, a, a leading chief petty officer out of uh, an exploitation cell um, that does IED forensics and explosives forensics. And that was out in uh, Herat, Afghanistan. So I went out to Herat on the uh, western side of Afghanistan and uh, worked uh, to manage that um, exploitation cell. And incredible amount of work uh, that we were able to do, um, an incredible job that we were able to do um, and, and get out and see the battle space quite a bit. So I had a, a great time there. I uh, came back from Jaido, like I said, I commissioned um, out of there and I was uh, assigned to here to EOD Mobile Unit 2, where I'm at right now. But I was assigned as a, um, a platoon commander for uh, Special Operations Force or a soft platoon. And uh, we went out and trained up and deployed uh, in support of uh, Army Special Forces groups, uh, doing some certain missions there. Uh, so I got two pumps out of that. I went to uh, went overseas, uh, did a support down in Florida for a little bit as well. I uh, had a great time, and then uh, I did a little bit of time as a training officer there after that, but then uh, I, I transferred commands, went over to EOD Mobile at 6. If you'll notice uh, in the slide, it's no longer in Charleston at that point. Uh, when I left Mobile at 6 and uh, transferred to EOD school, uh, the unit deployed to Iraq as a task group, and then they ended up coming back and did a home port shift up to Virginia Beach. So uh, about the 2007 time frame, we consolidated uh, – all of our kind of spread out uh, mobile units to the fleet concentration areas of San Diego on the West Coast and then Virginia Beach here. Uh, so that's why mobile unit six is back there. So I went and I did the training officer tour there. I was good to go. I loved it. It was, uh, I was on the ground uh, with the platoons that were training up. I was able to give pretty good insight and uh, training to the junior officers about how to command and manage a scene um, while their chief is, is running the issue to ground and, and getting the problem solved. So. Uh, is a really rewarding career uh, move for me. It was one of our kind of junior up and coming milestones. So I was able to get it. There's not a lot of those seats. So it was, it was very beneficial to me. I also was able to make a deployment out of there. Um, I headed over to and I supported uh, uh, AFRICOM with some of their humanitarian efforts um, out of, out of uh, Germany. So that was a good time there as well. Uh, transferred from there uh, up to EOD Group 2. And I was the department head level uh, for uh, TOA management. I was the materiel and TOA officer, TOA table of allowance. Uh, it's all the, basically it's everything that we use in EOD. It's all of our equipment. It's all of our personal gear issue. Um, and you're just the, sitting in an office with some incredible individuals that were, uh, we were all able to you know, properly manage um, the technological refresh, um, technology refresh of our equipment, uh, phase replacement of our equipment, uh, make sure we update everything so we're not, you know, going back to the next war with outdated equipment. So that's the goal out there. Also nested in that office is um, uh, the maintenance side of the house, which, you know, not a lot of people think is 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 very cool to do, but it's a necessary evil at times. And it's one of those things that, you know, if your gear is not in good enough shape to work, it's not going to work. So you got to maintain it well. So that's nested underneath that. So I did that. Uh, for a couple of years, and and that was a bit outside my lane as a, an LDO. So my, as a limited duty officer, uh, I stay closed loop in the EOD community, and I my focus uh, for all of us LDOs is the training realm, and that's um, really our that's our bread and butter. So I left uh, N43 at Group, and I hit my milestone, which is where I'm at right now as the readiness officer uh, at EOD Mobile Unit Two, and my job there is to ensure that our platoons and our battalion, our headquarters staff is uh, ready to deploy, that they're trained up properly, they've got the right equipment, they've got the right training, they've got the right, you know, everything encompassing readiness. There's so much that goes into it, I can't I'd waste your time and, and bore you probably telling you about it, but um, it's a fascinating job from my uh, stance and it's, um, I'm happy to be there to do it and I'm very, uh, I'm privileged to be there. Again, I have a, an incredible group of, uh, of sailors and, and civilians that work underneath me and, and make my job actually really easy. So, oh, that's really uh, great. Uh, next slide. All right, so who we are. So we were founded by Rear Admiral Draper Kaufman. Um, he learned the, the cliff notes on him. He learned bomb disposal uh, in London during the Blitz uh, in World War II when Germany was bombing them. Um, and it's that was, I can't even imagine uh, the courage it would have taken to go down there and do that. Um, it's, you know, they say, they'll tell you at EOD school if you ever end up going. A lot of our procedures, if not all of them, are written in blood. 
And that's true because, you know, the British bomb disposal teams, our early U.S. disposal teams, you know, a lot of these procedures were untried. And so there's only one way to try them. And so some uh, some people lost their lives, unfortunately, doing that. And unfortunately, we still we still have that aspect among us because of the risk of the job. But at the end of the day, um, you know, he went over there uh, and learned when he probably didn't have to, but he had the uh, uh, the foresight of what it would do for our military as well. So uh, he put in the time and the effort. Uh, his background uh, is that he went to the Naval Academy. He was not able to commission due to some eyesight issue. So we went over and uh, joined a, a French ambulance corps. Uh, he was actually captured by the Germans. And when he was released, made his way to, uh, to London. And that's how he kind of got involved there. He was able to secure a commission, I think, about a month before Pearl Harbor. So when Pearl Harbor struck, he went uh, out to uh, out there and he, and he defused a bomb. Uh, I think it was a big 500-pound Japanese bomb. Um, sitting in the middle of the base. And uh, due to the success of that, uh, he was uh, tasked to come back and build out what would become, you know, Navy EOD. So he built out the Navy Bomb Disposal School in Washington Yard. Uh, and then he was there for a few years, and then he was tasked to move on and organize uh, the underwater demolition teams, which was the precursor for the Navy SEALs. So we have a shared uh, founding father with those guys. Um, since our inception, we've been in pretty much every conflict that the U.S. has been in. Uh, so we're we're you know highly sought after, especially recently with the the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, it's really kind of brought to the forefront uh, people that really probably didn't know who we were, uh, sitting in the background a little bit um, in the periphery. To you know, a lot of we're a special operations community in the Navy, but. You know, we, we operate in support of a lot of different units and maneuver elements. And so a lot of times, you know, it's just we're seen as kind of an enabler a little bit. But then at, at the end of the day, people really have begun to see what we bring to the table. And it's been an incredible, uh, you know, advancement for our community recently. So, um, so yeah, so we've been involved in all those, uh, uh, every conflict that we've had since our inception. Um, we're a pretty small community, really small community. There's about 1,800 of us total between officer and enlisted, about 1,300 enlisted. Uh, and last check that I saw online was about 470 officers. We have unrestricted line officers. We have limited duty officers. Uh, and then we have a few warrant officers as well. Our warrant officer program um, went away the year that I commissioned. So those are uh, starting to phase out. Uh, but it's the uh, smallest unrestricted line community the Navy has, is about 2%. So. Uh, we formerly became a rate for EOD in 2006. Um, so like I said before, I was uh, an aviation ordinance by trade when I came into the Navy and went to EOD school in that pipeline. Um, and it just, you know, there was, it's difficult to be an EOD tech and try to make rank in the, as an aviation ordinance because I don't do all the work that they do. I don't work on the racks. I don't work on the, the aircraft and all that. So it's, um, it just made, it made sense for the special operations side of the Navy between SWIG, SEALs, divers, EOD uh, to go and get a, their own rate. So 2006, uh, they switched over. I actually um, was pinned. I was frocked to AO1 uh, one day, and then the very next day we converted over, so I became EOD1. Um, but uh, the job of who we are is ultimately we're out there to support uh, fleet combatant commanders and functional commanders around the globe and different uh, aspects of our job. We have, uh, I mentioned it earlier, responsible organizations or rest boards. And the, the primary or the four that we have are mine countermeasures. Uh, that's our undersea mine countermeasures capability. Uh, then we have mobility platoons that uh, we call MO platoons. We have Naval Special Warfare platoons, NAVSOF platoons, and they operate in support of uh, SEALs. And then we have special operations forces or soft platoons, and we operate in support of um, other soft elements uh, outside of the Navy spectrum. Um, we have shore-based detachments that aren't really a rest board or responsible organization, but they are, uh, it's an opportunity to support uh, regions in the United States. We have two that are overseas as well. I can get into those later if there's any interest in those, but uh, they support um, local law enforcement, they support the FBI, they support the region. And so, you know, an example of those guys, uh, we just had um, uh, some good work done by our shore base detachment out of Norfolk here. Uh, they were just called down to um, Outer Banks in North Carolina. There was a, an old World War One or World War II 100 pound bomb that washed ashore. So they went in there and, uh, you know, it's, it's encrusted with all sorts of sea growth and, um, you know, it's a little dangerous to try to get in there and, and disarm something like that. So uh, they went in there and they 
buried it a little bit deeper on the sand and they they detonated it. So uh, there's some good work to do at our shore-based detachments. Um, uh, and that's just one of those options that we have at our at our echelon six level. So, so that's how they handle that situation in particular. And instead of like arming it, they just exploded it. So yeah, I mean, if you see pictures of it, it's pretty fresh on the news. If you saw a picture of it, it's really encrusted. There's not really much. It's probably the hazard isn't worth the. Uh, I mean, you're just disarming it to take it and blow it up, blow it up somewhere else. On the outer banks, it was uh, deep in the ground. You know, they get all the approvals that they need to to do stuff like that. But it was uh, it's the best course of action for that scenario. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so on the on the pictures on the right hand side, if you look at the top there, that's the explosive ordnance disposal badge. It's affectionately known as the crab. Uh, the crab is issued. It's the exact same across all branches of service. Uh, excuse me, all branches of service, uh, except for the gold badge on the right hand side. That's Navy specific for the officer community right now. Um, but the the meaning behind it, the shield that you see in the background, obviously it's our job to protect against uh, explosive hazards. Uh, the bomb itself represents the main job that we do. The three fins represent conventional uh, chemical, biological, and then nuclear um, ordnance. Uh, the lightning bolts represent the power and destructive power of the bomb itself. And then the laurels, the wreath underneath it um, represent two things. It, it represents you know, our accomplishments and our accolades as a community, as well as uh, a remembrance of those that have uh, passed in the line of duty doing our job. So the slick bomb, or what you see on the left-hand side, that's the basic badge. Uh, you get that out of EOD school, officers enlisted alike across the forces. Uh, and then after some time in the community, um, you go through a lot of training and, and a lot of research and, and your own uh, your own lookups for, for line items and training, uh, getting after certain qualifications and certifications. Uh, you can try for your senior uh, EOD badge. And that's not only is it uh, a, a recognition or a status um, and supervisory uh, increase in responsibility, but there's also monetary uh, benefits tied to that. Um, and then on the right-hand side, uh, or as, I'm sorry, as you move right, uh, as you're looking at it, the star and wreath on the top designates a master EOD technician, so a master crab. Uh, and that's the that's the highest that we can attain as far as uh, mastery of the uh, the field. And then the gold badge is just what we give to um, the officers have to earn uh, throughout their career, uh, just designates uh, a little bit different. It designates them as an 1140 unrestricted line officer. So, Next slide. Uh, so this is a, a video. It's just, it's the America's uh, Navy video on EOD. So we'll play that. Uh, bad days in EOD tech is doing administrative work. <laughs> As EOD techs, we work on the ground, integrated with special forces, skydiving and parachuting. We work underwater, clearance of underwater mines. You go down there and you're looking for a mine in the middle of the ocean. Can't really see very well. But, uh, it, I mean, it's exciting. We have um, the surface IED threat today. Most of the time, mines are made out of metal, um, which means they're denser than rocks or sandbars or anything like that. So we use different sensors to try to hone in on that specific yeah, shape, like specific that. density, specific um, signature that a mine is going to give us. You have just your kind of your basic uh, multi-tool. That's kind of like your get out of jail. You have your shears to cut stuff, uh, mine probes. You have to be creative. You're not always going to have what you need on hand. And that's kind of where a big part of our training comes in is to kind of give you the outside of the box thinking. Uh, this is the Talon. It has four cameras. You can do a lot with the robot. We carry explosive charge with the robot, so we can drop it end up just blowing it up right there if we want to. Or we can get into more like surgical precision movements, cut wires if we wanted to. Every scenario is different. Uh, I mean, the coolest part is obviously blowing stuff up. Just give me a 10 digit grid on where you're blowing it. Okay, okay. I can respect higher so let them know. Okay, cool. My first impression of it was just, that's a lot louder and heavier than I thought it would be. It's not like in the movies. Oh, 
Oh, I mean, there's all kinds of explosives. Uh, C4, a lot of plastic explosives. Um, Data sheet, which is just a sheet explosive. We'll spend a week learning how to make homemade explosives to be able to identify them in the field. In EOD, there's never a black and white answer. It's always what's going to be the safest, what's going to be the best, because this is an inherently risky job. All right, next slide. Uh, so this next one is, uh, it's it's new on the street for us. It's, it discusses the uh, 2030 vision for us as a community. So if you, the, the cliff notes on it are basically, we've been in ground combat operations for a very long time. And where are we focusing our efforts um, in the future? You know, what are we moving to? What's What's best for our nation? that we can and how best we can support that. So that's generally what this addresses right here. Slide. Thank you. Okay, so what do I do as an EOD technician? You probably picked up on a lot of this in my conversation so far, but uh, so we locate, identify, render safe, and or explosively dispose of foreign and domestic ordnance. So that includes the conventional chemical, biological, nuclear, underwater and terrorist improvised devices. And again, the underwater aspect really makes us, aside from our mobility skill sets uh, and our integration on this, the soft side of the house, uh, the underwater really sets us apart uh, from the other DOD branches. 
Uh, Have you personally boat. had to do a lot of underwater uh, work? I have. So when I was my first platoon was uh, was an MCM platoon. It was a detachment eight, uh, mobile unit six in Charleston. We went out to at the kickoff of the war, and you know we were clearing the routes that we wanted to clear, uh, making sure that they were um, safe. And you know nowadays we've advanced. We have a, you know companies called the Expeditionary uh, Mine Countermeasures Companies, and it encompasses uh, command and control structure. Uh, it has an EOD MCM platoon underneath it. Uh, they have an unmanned systems platoon underneath it uh, that are made up of not EOD techs, but um, a real great group of support personnel uh, that run what we call fish. But uh, they look, you probably you saw a picture in there. Uh, it looks like torpedoes, but right. they're basically we're running for sonar. Uh, so we run those fish back and forth and then that comes up and then there's um, a PMA cell. So a post mission analysis cell and they do uh, the readout on on the you know they look at the waterfall the sonar and figure out where are these mine like contacts so that used to take place on board a ship um uh, mine hunters uh mine countermeasure ships uh it still can but this is an aspect that we provide from the umcm underwater mcm uh, realm that really kind of provides commanders operational commanders a one-stop shop um for making sure uh and compared to you know the aviation aspect or the surface aspect that makes up the mcm triad but um, we provide a, a very capable uh, response option for them uh, in the event of any um, uh, illicit or, or suspected mining activities. But when I went back through the mine ships, the mine hunters or the MCMs would uh, go over and classify marks. And so we'd have to go out and dive on them. So sometimes in the, in the middle of the Gulf, it was a, a bag of rice that had probably been sitting on the bottom for a while. Some of it was a large anchor chain that looked like a mine line. Uh, but then there was actual mines, you know, in the kickoff of uh, 1990, the, the first Gulf War, we had a lot of very brave members that went down and uh, were able to go against active mines on the bottom and bring them to the surface and, and get rid of them. Um, I've, I've got some good experiences at the kickoff of the war. They had the shock and awe that everybody was uh, right. the new right. was touting and uh, all these Tomahawk, you know, missiles kicking off the ships and flying into Baghdad. Well, some of them didn't make it to their targets and some of them splashed in the water. So my platoon was actually uh, tasked to go out and uh, take care of those. So I got some good experience, um, you know, diving down just over 200 feet and, and blowing up those missiles underwater. So it was pretty cool stuff. Um, but, but yeah, so the, the, the MCM side of the house, you're going to get, you're going to get a lot of bottom time. That's for sure. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we locate, uh, identify uh, weapons of mass destruction, improvised weapons of mass destruction. Um, and then, you know, how that's handled afterwards is, depends on the unit that you're with. Um, we enable access overall during military operations. We are to provide a, a safe route either through or around, um, depending on what the mission set is, to get uh, to a target. Uh, we can, inside of a target, inside of a house, we provide that expertise as well, you know, entering rooms, clearing rooms, etc. So, um, we support and conduct ordinance related intelligence collection, uh, counterterrorism operations. Um, we have under NECC, which is our, uh, our echelon three, our, our type commander, Naval Expeditionary Combat Command. Um, and one of our elements under there, the tribes is a uh, Navy Expeditionary Intelligence Community. So we work with those guys, work with other intelligence communities, um, uh, and we provide information on weapon systems or just, you know, mainly, like I said, when I was doing the exploitation cell uh, in Afghanistan, you know, just the forensics that we can provide, you know, on, on um, uh, tactics, techniques, procedures, or TTPs uh, of our enemy and the, uh, the insurgent force that's not state sponsored, but is very crafty and pretty intelligent in what they do. So we always want to stay a step ahead of the enemy and, uh, and integrating with our intelligence collection agencies allow us to do that pretty well. So, um, Operate, maintain, and uh, repair specialized duty equipment and combat equipment. So I, I said earlier when I was the, the table of allowance manager, the TOA manager uh, for group two, maintenance, you know, not not the funnest aspect of our job, but certainly a necessary uh, requirement. And uh, because, you know, you look down on the ground or look down at those pictures in the bottom left, we have the talent robot right there. We have a couple of the robotic systems. Um, that's a large system. Um, it's a, we have medium and small. Um, more portable systems as well. But, you know, if you're on the ground in major combat operations, you know, we have depots where we can send robots that are either blown up or broken and need to be repaired. We can exchange them when you're out on your own and we're not in major combat operations. 
Uh, you really need to be able to, uh, if you get sent the part, be able to fix it or uh, maintain the equipment so that it doesn't break just to do the normal wear and, uh, wear and tear, excuse me. So that's part of the part of the thing that we do, but uh, we conduct and supervise open and closed circuit diving, uh, explosive demolition operations, parachuting operations, small arms proficiency, uh, tactical delivery, and then insertion and extraction methods. So you saw in some of those videos, uh, and I'll get into it a little bit later, but that the diver in the upper left that's attacking that, uh, placing that charge on the moored mine contact, uh, he's diving what's called a Mark 16. Uh, so that's our closed circuit breathing apparatus that we use, and we can get down some pretty good depths uh, to go after underwater ordnance uh, with that. I'll go into the capabilities of that a little bit further, uh, excuse me, into the slideshow. Um, but then obviously open circuit is just scuba that we do as well. And we, we employ scuba operationally as well. So depending on the scenario or what we've been tasked to do, that's, we have a um, we have some options. So that's good. Um, we provide training and assistance to military, federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies. So we do a lot of that uh, through our shore-based attachments. Uh, we also do some exercises involved with Homeland uh, Defense. Uh, and then we have other, we have certain uh, rest or platoons, maybe mobility platoons that will deploy actually out into um, subject matter expert exchanges or SME or SME exchange, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, and they'll go down and help out uh, other foreign militaries. And we kind of, our, our goal is to increase, to assess, but help them out uh, based on that assessment and increase their EOD skills. So a lot of really cool things that you can do kind of across the spectrum inside of EOD. And then um, one of the more interesting things that I thought when I first came in, um, I'd heard about it, but I never really knew much about it. We provide support to the Secret Service uh, for the protection of VIP. So the president, the vice president, foreign dignitaries that come in, they have their own protective elements, but we also assist those guys as well, especially when they're on uh, U.S. soil. But it's a really interesting job you know you're working with some incredible um incredible people through the secret service uh and then some of the local law enforcement that are there uh so we have a thing um i don't know how much the audience knows about posse comitatus but it basically designates that in um, inside the united states uh, the military is not allowed to uh, assist in almost all situations, sometimes we get designated to do so, but we can't assist with law enforcement type um, applications or jobs. So um, Secret Service is interesting. It's, you know, there's some morbid humor in the community, but um, uh, one of the sayings, you know, when you're going out and doing Secret Services, our job is to either find or function. So we go in um, one, I'll give an example. I went to uh, uh, President Bush was traveling, I believe it was Toledo. Uh, we went, uh, my partner and I were on a team that got assigned to clear the room that he was going to be staying in for a few hours. Uh, so our job was to go in and after it had been swept by the Secret Service, we went in and, uh, you know, sat on the bed, jumped on the bed, opened all the drapes, flushed the toilet, turned on the water, turned on the lights, turned on the TV, do everything that you think an occupant of that room would do. And either, and we look under, you know, pillows and stuff before we start jumping on it just to see if something's there. But so you either find it and you hand it over to the uh, local law enforcement or you function it. Um, wow. but our job with one of those guys is That's pretty that? interesting. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, there's a lot of deviant people out there that would uh, find ways to dispose of people in that way. So pretty Absolutely. Crazy. And then, uh, you know, when you're internationally, you know, you don't control the space as much as we do here in the United States. So it can get a little more entertaining as well but there's a lot of different jobs and a lot of different things you can do in support of those missions but it's really quite an honor you know for the president of the united states to to say that you know we've been on missions and protected him over here or over there and it's it's pretty cool so very cool um, next slide so our training uh what does it take to get into the community you know like i said we vet our our um our candidates pretty well physically uh and then you're vetted um academically uh, when you go through the schooling. So on the enlisted side of the house, obviously go to boot camp, and then you go to what's called dive prep, and that's up at Great Lakes. Um, right now, it's different than when I went through boot camp back in the day. Um, I came in under a challenge that allowed me, um, I signed paperwork for the challenge. I was guaranteed uh, to have certain number of four or five times to try out for and select for a special program. Um, Nowadays, you sign for and you go into, I believe, a 900 division, um, a boot camp division, and you're with other uh, EOD, diver, and air uh, 
uh, candidates and then SEAL and Swiffer with their candidates as well. So it's a little increase in PT, um, probably over what you would get uh, when I got went through. Um, we had to kind of create our own PT at times. But um, you you go to dive prep after boot camp. Dive prep is uh, it's probably one of our highest attrition rates from what I understand. I, I tried to look for and I apologize. I tried to look for the numbers on that. I just couldn't get anybody to respond to me on those. But uh, I do know that it's one of the highest just because a lot of people think they're comfortable in the water. But when you put some heavy scuba tanks on their back, you put a snorkel in their mouth, you flood their snorkel and you flood their mask with water um, and you don't give them fins to sustain themselves and you ask them to tread water for five minutes. Um, a lot of people just realize that this might not be for them. Uh, so they do a good job of uh, keeping it physically demanding as far as physical training or PT is concerned. And then they're starting to get into a little bit of helping out with the academic side and going over a little bit of uh, dive physics, dive medicine. You follow on from dive prep. It's only a few weeks long. You follow on to dive school down in Panama City, Florida, uh, Naval Diving and Salvage Training Center. Uh, and that's where you go through the, really the, the core of our skill set. You're learning how to you know, um, be mobile in the water. You know, all these things that look really cool and, you know, the skydiving and the jumping out of helicopters and the diving underwater, you know, they're all mobility skill sets. They are skills that allow us to get to work. And so we need to be proficient at those. But um, one of the biggest things that we need to be proficient at is diving because it's um, some of our work is obviously underwater. So um, you go there and it's a pretty big, uh, pretty good attrition rate there as well, because you really get into the the nuts and bolts of dive medicine and dive physics. And it's not like taking a class in high school or taking a class in college. It's uh, like drinking from a fire hose. You're going to get a lot of information over the course of two, maybe three days, maybe even less. And then you're going to test on it. And if you don't pass, you get a little one night to remediate and you can you, know, you go on and take it again. If, if you pass, you continue on. If you don't, you get either rolled or you get dropped from the program. So we do dive medicine, dive physics, um, and then you go into the diving portion of it. The good thing about dive school is uh, once you start breathing a regulator underwater, you start earning an extra $150 a month. Uh, it's uh, scuba pay and student pay. Um, but at dive school as well, we learn uh, all aspects of and how to dive the Mark 16, which is, again, our underwater um, our breathing apparatus. Uh, so you go through dive school. Uh, it's when I went through it was 13 weeks, I think. And I think it's a lot shorter now. I think it's, I believe it's about six or seven weeks now. And they follow on to EOD school from there, but we'll catch them up with the officers, the officer pipeline. Uh, if you go that route, you'll do your commissioning source, whatever that is. And then you go to the joint diving officer, which is a six month uh, course down in at the same place at the Navy Diving Salvage Training Center. You go through everything that our dive school uh, candidates go through, but it's more intense because you're also covering down on um uh, the Navy diving side of the house. So the surface applied and a little bit more into probably chamber operations, um, uh, things of that nature. So once the officers graduate that program and the enlisted graduate dive school, they merge together and everybody goes through EOD school together. So the whole pipeline, uh, last I heard was about a year long. Um, but you know, you factor in holidays and um, leave periods. There's a lot of academic roles. There's physical roles. People get injured. Uh, so there's some setbacks. If you're going to go through the program, you can plan on between a year, year and a half to get through the, the pipeline and graduate. You graduate from EOD school and you get the slick bomb or that, that badge, the basic crab uh, that I talked about earlier. Uh, from there, you move out to Fort Benning. You go through static line jump school. That's a pipeline school for us now. Uh, expeditionary combat skills down Gulfport, learning um, basically the expeditionary skill of shooting, but not just flat range shooting. It's a little more intense than that. Uh, from there, you follow on to tactical training out at our training unit in San Diego, uh, training evaluation unit one. And that is uh, where you're kind of getting into the more, you know, a little more in depth. So you might have been on some some boats and driving a boat when you were in dive school and in EOD school underwater division. Um, but you're going to get a little more coxswain training and how to properly drive those boats. Uh, when you go to the t uh, TAC training, you're going to learn basic roper. Uh, you're going to do some more, a little more advanced shooting. Um, and 
learn things like I, I don't know if they still do it, but we trained on the when I went through the the AGA, our full face mask. I saw some guys in that video that had it. So it's cool because you can put a communication system in there so you can talk to people when you're underwater. But so you learn different things like that. And then uh, once you're finished with that, that's at this point right now, that's where you're uh, a full up round and ready to go to your Moby in it for your first tour. Um, so uh, before we get into the, the tour stuff, and, I, and I'm trying to interject a few questions from the cadets, there it was actually a very uh, specific question from, from one of our personnel who was asking, and it, it is actually from a third class NROTC midshipman, okay? And he's wondering what he can do to set his application apart in the next two years or so, because he's, you know, his goal is really to go EOD. That's his number one career choice. So any advice for him since he's, you know, still going through college, still third class, but, you know, in order to make himself maybe a little bit more, you know, marketable for the program. Sure. Uh, our uh, EOD officer community manager actually has a program where um, EOD makes rounds to go out and, uh, and talk to the NROTC. Uh, communities. So I've done several uh, in the past. I'm actually slated to go down to Florida in the spring and do a couple briefs at uh, Florida A&M and then at uh, University of Florida as well. But depending on where he's at, he should probably the best course of action be to reach out through his um, his leadership there and find out when the EOD brief is going to happen. Uh, and if they do not have one, if they can reach out to the community manager, the community manager can look to schedule one. Um, but as far as his package itself is concerned, there's an opportunity, uh, the, the Naval Academy does a 24 hour screener. And in the past, I don't know what their current policy is on it, but in the past, uh, they have allowed NROTC members to join them for that. Uh, if you complete the 24 hour screener, and by 24 hours, I mean you are going full on for 24 hours uh, in the water, on the ground, they're just keeping you motivated and seeing what you do to motivate yourself. Um, and uh, you'll leave there with a letter of recommendation for your package. So it's a good opportunity if you can get to that or even look at that, um, that'd be ideal. Um, one of the things that I tell a lot of the candidates, um, you gotta be a self-starter, you gotta be self-motivated. Uh, you really have to love physical uh, things. You have to love, love working out. You've gotta love um, challenging yourself. And if that's the mindset that you have, you know, it's not, the bravado, we put ourselves in these bad positions or these positions where we challenge ourselves physically and mentally because the reality is there's a lot of things that look really cool uh, in Hollywood or in presentations like this, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of hard work, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of challenges involved to getting to those moments, right? So mm -hmm. it's uh, there's the best thing he could do is you know, probably reach out through that avenue up to the community manager. There is a warning order. I'm sure you can find it online to talk about what he needs to do to physically prepare uh, for that. But hopefully um, his school has uh, an EOD officer coming to do a brief for them. They'll answer a lot of those questions. If not, uh, just reach out to the community manager. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. That's great advice. And since we're answering a few questions here, you know, one of the cadets is, is asking about the bomb suits. Right. It's like, how, how, how easy is it to work in one of those things? And, you know, are they really heavy? They're not really heavy. I mean, anytime you first put on either your vest and all the equipment and your, mm -hmm. your magazines and your backpack, and then you take all that off and you put on a bomb suit, it's probably not too much different. Um, you learn how to work in it. We train in everything and we train constantly uh, in our, our training cycles at the platoon level. And we do that because we want everything to be comfortable uh, when you get there, you certainly don't want to find yourself in a situation where you need to get in the bomb suit for the first time when you're right. on deployment. So, um, as far as that's concerned, it's kind of funny when you when I went through EOD school when I was in IED division, they showed a video of the next generation bomb suit that we were getting, and it showed this. I swear they must have had an Olympic athlete in there because this person was doing gymnastics on the parallel bars and you know right. all the round off back handsprings on the floor routine it was pretty comical and then you go out and get the bomb suit and at first you feel you know a little michelin man you can't really move around but you get used to it the 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 worst part about the bomb suit is that it can get hot especially over in iraq and afghanistan in the middle east uh it can get pretty hot um but again that's why we train to that so you 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 learn to operate and it becomes second skin which is what kind of the mindset you need to get after is you know if you're not comfortable in something or using one of the tools you need to be staying later and 
yeah. and learning to demonstrate proficiency. And the bomb suit certainly goes with that. It does have a cooling suit, although every time I've ever put this cooling suit on underneath, it either it adds weight because it adds a, about a gallon of frozen water uh, or and, and water, a frozen block, and then a, a bunch of water, and it starts cycling throughout the suit um, in little tubes. But every time I've had it on, it tends to break. So I don't even bother. <laughs> <laughs> so it's perfectly suited for say the moon but not where you are so yeah exactly yeah, um, yeah. so an another question from the cadets is uh has to do with like mines right so you know the the video is showing in, in that training scenario about the army mines is, is that something that was constantly uh on the docket every day of looking for ieds and looking for mines and and getting rid of them i mean was it you know, were they just so uh, prolific that they were everywhere or it, yeah it's it's kind of eye opening when you when, when you go through EOD school um, you go through ground ordnance division and ground ordnance division covers down on um, rockets projectiles uh, and landmines and uh, the landmine division they kind of talk about you know how prolific landmines are throughout the world and a lot of the areas that we find ourselves operating in mm -hmm. are known um, to be, you know, high concentration areas for landmines. In Iraq, where I was at in Baghdad, landmines were more used as like a primary charge in an IED. Um, uh, they didn't really use them uh, as you would think that, you know, for type by function of a, or how you'd use a landmine. Um, there's a video that you see when you're going through EOD school, it's a little off putting, but it's really weird, but they get so used to it overseas that you know, they go downrange and they just figure out ways through trial and error how to disarm those. And there's a little, uh, a video of a little girl or a picture of a little girl, uh, probably three or four years old. She's on like a little homemade tricycle and both her big wheels in the back are uh, Italian landmines, which is the yeah. guys that took the picture, I think, went up there and, you know, she was not happy, but they took her tricycle from her. Uh, <laughs> went but, um, you know, there's, uh, it is, it's certainly something that you consider, which is, you know, in those those uh, detection methods don't just detect landmines, they also detect pressure plates or mm -hmm. uh, any other, you know, the difference that we're looking for in the soil or whatever, wherever we're at and whatever we're going, uh, whatever we're going after. So um, they are somewhat prevalent over there, overseas, a lot more um, in some areas than in others. Um, but, you know, you can go back to certain areas and, you know, we have one of the mission areas that we send uh, EOD text to is one of the follow on kind of a short detachment or, or an out of cycle tour was as uh, uh, the defense uh, POW MIA accounting agency. And uh, one of their jobs to go after um, and track down leads to find um, service members that are missing in action. And so one of the roles that EOD provides is that, you know, whether it's say it was a crash, the person was a pilot and it was a crashed, aircraft did they have ordinance on so EOD would be there but in things places like um, Vietnam and the Pacific Rim there's a lot of landmines in those jungles so sometimes those guys are there and uh, they're a little more prevalent there so it just depends on where you're at and what you're doing ah okay makes sense um mm -hmm. another one of the questions for the cadets I know we're kind of getting off your topics here but you That's know fine. they're really interested in this is um you know with all the the, the things that you've done, is there one particular mission or, or activity that you were on that sticks out as like very, very dangerous? Something that really, you know, to the level that you wish to discuss, of course. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things that, mm -hmm. <laughs> that happened to us over there and, you know, not just me, but, you know, you come back off of a mission and you hear about other guys what right. they went through and uh and then you have other friends that are in other platoons and other mobile units and um it's just such a, across the spectrum of the things but um i'll be honest with you when you're in the moment at least this is my experience and i think probably for a lot of my my buddies um when you're in the moment you're not really thinking about it again we train a lot to right. where everything is kind of muscle memory mm -hmm. um certainly afterwards either years or months or weeks days there have been a couple hours maybe where you sit back and you're like, wow, that was close. That was um, sure, that sure. Was, that was something that probably could have gone south. You know, I do have moments that where I, you know, thank my stars that I'm here. Uh, a couple of those. I was sleeping one morning in Iraq. Uh, we had a thing called IDF or um, indirect fire. And uh, the insurgents were, you know, they would hit us either in the morning or they'd hit us at night. Well, they lobbed in some, some 
you know, mortars and you could feel them shaking on the ground. The building that we were in had a hardened structure in the center. So our, you know, MO was to get up once we heard that and go in the middle. And I was kind of tired and I was laying there. I was like, oh man, I really didn't want to get up this early, but whatever. So I'm slowly getting up and I heard something sound outside my door. My, the, the room I was in was like a, an old kind of, not a high bay, but a smaller bay for storing things, but it had a door that went outside it was thin metal and basically the unit that was there before us just put some spray foam in between wood and that door so that's all i had between me and the outside but um it sounded like somebody broke some cinder blocks um anyway so i got up i was like well that's kind of close maybe a, a mortar dud fired or whatever and i went inside and my team chief came out of his room and he's like hey did you hear that i was like yeah after it was all done and we got clearance to walk around we went around our building and um 10 feet from where i was sleeping a 120 millimeter mortar um came in and you know they lobbed five in on us that morning four of them detonated the one that landed next to me for some reason just didn't uh, and that's one of the things that i always kind of think about in the back of my mind like that's pretty crazy <laughs> like i don't know why you know i think i had my own theory on why it was and i was actually kind of looking at some pictures of that um maybe last year it was and mm -hmm. uh, i i kind of reanalyzed i'm like no the theory that i thought as to why that didn't go off is doesn't hold true right now so um, there's that one. I was in uh, Afghanistan uh, flying over Herat. We just got picked up. We were going up to uh, the Spanish uh, controlled area, uh, Balam Ragab, and um, uh, we were going up to do a weapon buyback. And uh, I didn't know this, but two of the guys that I was with, one Navy and one uh, Army EOD guy, uh, they told the crew chief that they wanted a wild ride while we were flying up there. They wanted it to be fun, like do some dips and whatever. So this event happened and I look over and I could see what was going on or I kind of knew what was going on. And these guys over here were all laughing and, and having fun with it, but it was actually turned out to be a real event. So what happened was we were flying at about uh, 8,000 feet over uh, Herat. And when I was in Iraq, um, I had a job that I had to kind of go back and forth and, and drop off certain information to um, uh, one of the headquarters units back in uh, at Baghdad at the airport, the international airport. And, uh, so I would fly on the helos and, and every now and then these spurious signals would come out and the uh, countermeasure would kick uh, out of the burst. So I kind of got used to looking at those. And I remember we were like climbing over Herat and I saw the flares kick out. I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And about a split second after that, the helo took a nosedive down to our right. Um, my weapon that was slung around me started floating above me. I was like, what the heck's going on? And I look up and the door gunner was like leaning out and pointing and you could see out the door uh, off to the side, you could see a, a spiral grate of smoke coming and there was a detonation uh, in the air about 400 yards behind us. So someone fired a man portable air defense system at us while we were uh, wow. flying over. That was uh, that was six days before I went home on uh, R&R. &R. <laughs> so that that's one of those things like at the time, your adrenaline's going and you don't really, you don't really think about it. Um, but, you know, in hindsight, after things kind of started to well down, you get home in R&R &R, uh, with mm -hmm. your family and you're like, that was uh, that was pretty close. Wow. You know? so, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's uh, there's a lot of you know moments where where you think, you know, they would be crazy or scary or um, frustrating. And there certainly are. But, you know, I'm, I'm not a warmonger by any means. Uh, none of us in our community are. But we certainly love to go out and ply our trade and do our thing. And uh um, I've certainly had some of the greatest moments or experiences, I think, in my life on deployments and, and certainly combat operations. But um, that's great. That's really great. Um, so, you know, Ed, Ed, I, I do want to, you know, see if I do we have any more questions from the cadets. So cadets, if you have any more information, please shove it up here. I'm so sorry, Lieutenant, but we are running out of our scheduled time. Oh, and man, okay. You know, I, I told you before we started, cadets, this is true. I told you before we started that as soon as we start getting into it, time flies. So certainly hope that all of you have absolutely gotten something out of this. So, you know, as we're, you know, concluding what we're talking about here, I do want to ask you, this is our cadets' number one favorite question of all time. Okay. So it's going to make you think for a second. So if you've, you've heard this, okay. But I definitely want you to think about this for a second. So this is their number one question. The number one question is, if you were to describe the Navy with just one word, just one word, what would that word be and why? It's harder than you think, isn't it? Yeah. But you only get one word, so you got to make it a good one. 
uh, incredible. Incredible. Okay. And, uh, so the opportunities has provided me, um, provided my family, uh, right. just everything and the, the people that I work with uh, day in and day out, the people that I've deployed with, um, the units that we've worked with, you know, just it's not Hollywood. It's reality for us. And so it's, uh, it's absolutely incredible. It, that, you know, that's great. And, and some of the, the great stuff that you, you've shared with us today. And you know, we, we could probably do a, an easy three hour special on this because there's so much great content. So uh, if you're up yeah. for a sequel, maybe we'll hit you up for it if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. I really appreciate the opportunity to come out here and share some stories with you guys and talk to you a little bit about the community. A lot of it is online, but, um, right. you know, hopefully you can talk to somebody. Uh, or maybe somebody else can come in and do one of these events and give you guys a little more information. But. Yeah, and it's very good. We have, oh, that was nice. Um, we, you know, we, we have had uh, a previous discussion, and I think it was called the Warrior Challenge Program, where mm -hmm. you were alluding to it earlier, where you're going in under special contracts for special forces, EOD, aviation rescue swimmers. So, you know, um, cadets, re refer back to that if you want to know more about, like, the, the introduction recruiting process for that. But you know, as the lieutenant says, it's 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 a mindset, it's physical, and you got to really want it, right? And uh, the training that we've seen here and the experiences that we've relayed. So, if you're looking for action, you know, this is definitely it, absolutely. So, uh, so lieutenant, on you know, on behalf of the Naval Sea Cadet Corps, um, I want to thank you for your time. I also want to thank everybody at EOD Group Two. They've been great as far as you know. Uh, giving us access to you folks. So you're, you're giving us some really good real world examples, of what it's like to serve out in the fleet. So fantastic stuff. Really appreciate it. Uh, for cadets, don't forget, all right, there's an online quiz with this. So we'll post that link really shortly. Take the quiz, get those two hours of a virtual dual credit and reinforce your knowledge. That's great. But most importantly, hit that like button. It makes MC1 Quinlan so happy. So smash it, subscribe, hit that notification bell. Let everybody know that you appreciate this. You know, puts a smile on her face and we all need that. So on behalf of myself, you know, MC1 Quinlan, STG1 Lewison, uh, Ensign DePippo, uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, being part of our presentation today. And we'll see you next time for another episode of Real Sailors, Real Sea Stories. Take care, everybody. Have a great evening.